Uh, good evening and welcome. I'm Professor Malcolm Brown. I'm a professor of cognitive neuroscience in the university and it's my pleasure this evening to be able to introduce Stephen Rose, who in fact I've known over a period of something like 40 years. I have first, of course, that very important announcement that begins every meeting these days, and that is, please will you make sure that your mobile phone is either switched off or on silent. So Stephen Rose took a degree in biochemistry in Cambridge and then a PhD in neurochemistry in London. And actually, not all that long afterwards, he became one of the founding professors of the Open University way back in 1969. And he's remained there since and is indeed an emeritus professor of the Open University now. He has visiting appointments in the United States, in Australia, in China. He's won many awards. He has published an enormous number of papers on neuroscience, particularly concerned with learning and memory mechanisms. Um, but besides that, of course, he's also written quite a lot of extremely well-known books and is known also for his great interest in the um, social and um, legal aspects of neuroscience. And indeed, he's very well known to us through his appearances and um, pronouncements in the media, and particularly from having been a panel member on the Moral Maze on Radio 4 across quite a lot of years. And so he is really an excellent person to talk to us about exactly what his title says up here, The Future of the Brain, The Promise and Perils of Tomorrow's Neuroscience. I ask you to welcome Stephen Rose. Thank you very much, Malcolm. And it's a great honor to have been invited to give one of your centenary lectures here at Bristol um, from someone who has been throughout his life, as Malcolm said, at one of Britain's newest universities. Um, centenaries for the Open University will come in 60 years' time, and they will certainly sort of be well beyond my lifespan there. Um, but it's also somewhat of a daunting experience for me. As Malcolm said, I'm a neuroscientist, and I'm also not merely in awe of Bristol as a university in general, but the extraordinarily distinguished reputation that Bristol's neuroscience has had over many, many years, uh, of course, of whom Malcolm is, is himself a distinguished representative. But I want particularly this evening to pay tribute to two Bristol neuroscientists, the first is my old friend Richard Gregory, who is sitting in the front row here. And I have to tell you that Richard is the only man in the world I know who can sit up in pyjamas in, in his bed early in the morning and tell three brilliant and erudite puns even before his first cup of coffee. I've, <laughs> I've, I've adored Richard even for more years than I've known Malcolm. The second tribute I'd like to pay is to a Bristolian who left Bristol only a few weeks ago, um, but has been in, extensively in the news over the course of the last weeks, and that is Professor David Nutt. I've um, disagreed with David on a number of points in, 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 in the past, but I have to say I'm thoroughly behind him at the moment in terms of his statements about cannabis, and we'll come to that briefly in what I have to say, and also in terms of resenting the disgraceful way in which the British government and Alan Johnson has behaved in discarding him and discarding sensible scientific advice. So my tribute to those two. What I want to speak about this evening is indeed, as in my title, it will be um, what's in the title is what's inside the tin, the promises of neuroscience. The 1990s um, for the National Institute of Health in the States and for many neuroscientists was the decade of the brain. 
This past decade has been, for many of us, the decade of the mind, the huge expansion of the development of the neurosciences, new techniques, new claims, have actually made it, I think, one of the hottest areas of biology. So my themes this evening are going to be what we know as neuroscientists, what we might know, what I will argue we cannot know about the relationships between brain and mind, and in the last third of what I want to say, to talk about the prospects and perils of the new neurotechnologies as they are emerging and as they're likely to emerge over the course of the next decades. So, let me start with the current state of play. Um, as I say, neuroscience is now the hottest field in biology. It's incredibly exciting to biologists, to psychologists, and even to philosophers. Um, my colleagues are offering to explain, mend, and manipulate the mind. And, of course, we're big business. We're funded by the state, by charities, by the big pharmaceutical companies, and, indeed, the military, and that's also something I'll come to at the end. And we're part of a vast enterprise. Um, if you go to the big annual American Society for Neuroscience meetings, there's some 30,000 neuroscientists meet each year. Europe is a bit more modest, and only about six or 8,000 of us manage to go. Um, but faced with that, we are making vast promises. We are promising to explain the mind. Now, for many of my colleagues, there is no problem about this. Um, here's the Nobel Prize winner, Eric Kandel, who says very simply, you are your brain. Here's Francis Crick in his book called The Astonishing Hypothesis. You're nothing but a bunch of neurons. Slightly more sophisticated, another Nobel Prize winner, the mind is the brain plus free will. I'm not quite sure how he makes that together. Um, but there's still, I want to argue, deep conceptual problems in our understanding of the relationship between mind and brain. We have a huge amount of data, but we're very poor in theories of ways of putting all of that together. But that hasn't stopped the vast expansion of neuroscience into all areas of cultural life at the moment. You only have to read um, the titles of the um, new disciplines that have got neuro tacked in front of them. We have neuroesthetics, neuroethics, neuromarketing, neuroeconomics, and many other neuros as well. And I talk only about the, um, the, the less maverick ones. I won't mention neurolinguistic programming in this context. So as well as those promises which are, if you like, conceptual and cut deeply into the philosophical and, and intellectual traditions of 2,000 years of European history, we have some technological promises of genetic tests um, to um, identify in advance potential neurological and devastating disorders, uh, the possibility of stem cells to cure neurological disease, pharmacogenetically tailored drugs to treat conditions such as depression, drugs to enhance performance, so-called cognitive enhancers or intelligence and memory, and ultimately happiness for all. Now, as well as those promises of beneficence, there are slightly more sinister ones to my mind as well. What a neuroscientist uh, about 30 years ago held out the promissory vision of what he called a psycho-civilized society. And these include the drugs to manipulate behavior, a technique of brain imaging called brain fingerprinting, which is supposed to be able to identify criminals, genetic predestination, electromagnetic thought control, and many, many other um, thought developments of that sort, which I shall come on towards the end of what I have to say. What I want to begin with is just very quickly to um, identify for you some of the new techniques in the neurosciences which are beginning to make some of these promises and prospects a little bit more likely. So, um, just to review them very briefly, the techniques that are available for the genetic manipulation of studying genes for behavior, the windows into the brain given by the new um, extraordinary imaging techniques, um, anyone of my age um, now regrets that they're not starting being a neuroscientist now rather than half a century ago simply because of the attraction that is uh, made possible by these extraordinary technologies. Smart pharmacology and, of course, the increasing possibility of brain-computer interfaces. 
It's possible, for example, to take mice and now some other species as well to knock out or to knock in specific genes and to therefore manipulate their behavior, genes which are associated with human diseases, genes which are associated or believed to be associated with cognitive abilities, with affect, with emotion, and so on, and study the effect of deleting or adding genes in this sort. The windows in the brain given by a whole range of new techniques, functional magnetic resonance imaging, magnetoencephalography, um, evoked response potentials, positron um, emission tomography, and so on, giving these pictures, um, some of which you'll see later, which are extraordinary views of the sort of the living inside dynamic brain, which one would never have thought were possible even only 10 or 20 years ago and smart pharmacology, the possibility of, of imaging individual nerve cells like this one here, identifying the targets for drugs, identifying the flow of molecules and, and ions across the, across the membrane of the neuron and so on. And again, you'll see more of this later on. And human-computer relations. Um, the possibility, for example, of implanted prostheses, which will actually sort of enable, um, in the words of their proponents, the blind to see, the deaf to hear, um, the paralyzed to move. Um, all these are the technologies which have been developed over the course of the last 10, 20, 30 years of the vast expansion of the neurosciences. And what's coming out of them is a range of new scientific insights. Um, for the neuroscientist, it's possible now to put together disciplines that were different in the past, anatomy, physiology, psychology. We can begin to identify the molecular processes which underlie communication, development, learning, my own uh, area of research, and aging. We can study the gene variants and biochemistry of neurological disorders. Um, and that is a huge new range of possibilities for us as neuroscientists. What I want to do is just briefly to look at what we know about the brain as a consequence of those developments, and we'll then look at the implications of those um, for the technologies and for our understanding of brain processes. But just to remind that those of you who are not familiar with the brain, here we have um, a human brain, um, and here we begin to see the immense complexity of the nerve cells inside the brain, um, their dendrites, um, their axons, and the myriad of communications between them. A single nerve cell up there, impaled by a microelectrode, and finally, the business end of the nerve cells and the brains, the synapses, the junction between one nerve cell and another, the site of action of, um, of, of neurotransmitters and of many, many drugs. And if you like, the point at which one nerve cell communicates with another and the point at which the dynamism and the plasticity of the nerve cell as these connections are made or break, broken occur. It's difficult to get a sense of the scale of what I'm looking at here, but to give you a sense of the scale on which that synapse is drawn, if I were to blow up my thumbnail to the same size as that, it would be about half a mile across. So the numbers involved are absolutely mind-boggling. Um, we now know from the Human Genome Program there are something like 20,000 genes um, in the 3 billion nucleotides that there are in the human genome. There are 100,000 different proteins, most of which are expressed in the brain. The brain has many more proteins expressed than any other region of the body. There are 100 billion neurons, nerve cells, in the cerebral cortex, the gray matter at the top of the brain, and there's something like 100 trillion synapses connecting those nerve cells. Now, that is very difficult to get to grips with as a set, as, as a set of figures. The first thing that is obvious is that we don't have enough genes to code for the individual proteins, let alone to specify all the nerve cells and all the connections between them. And that means that a lot of what happens in brain development is a chain, the wiring of the brain as a result of experience during development. But I thought there's another way um, of giving you a sense of the scale of those brain processes. If you take a very tiny cube of 50 cubic millimeters of brain cortex, you've got in that cubic millimeter, um, 50 cubic millimeters, um, 5 million neurons, up to 50 billion synapses, 22 kilometers of dendrites, and 220 kilometers of axons. 
So the complexity of what one is looking at, the possible range of combinations and connections between one, brain, one part of the brain and another, um, far exceeds the number of particles in the known universe. It is a phenomenally complicated system. And of course, it's all connected up in ways which are not far from random or we couldn't exist. So the brain consists of a multitude of mini organs. They're massively interconnected. For example, at the back of the head here, there's something like 30 different modules in the visual system, and each is responsible for analyzing one feature of the environment, color, shape, motion, and so on. And that leads to a theoretical problem, the first theoretical problem. We experience the world in a coherent sort of way. Um, most of the time, we have a sense of unity, and yet there are all these different brain regions doing different sorts of analysis. So the question is, how are they all connected together? And at one point, um, the idea was very simple. They'd all connect up and report up to some little region at the top of the brain, which would integrate the whole lot and send the messages down again so that you could actually, so, so that you were controlled, if you like, by a little homunculus in the top of the brain. Now, a moment's thought, um, although it actually was nearly half a century of thought before re people realized this was impossible, um, says that can't be the case because the homunculus would have to have another homunculus inside it and so on, and the brain must be organized on different sorts of principles. Um, they don't report upwards to some common command center, the homunculus. Instead of that, the different regions of the brain communicate with one another in a self-organizing sort of way. There are multiple connections between the different regions, and they organize themselves much more, I have to say, like a well-organized anarchic commune than by a central command economy. Um, and that is, I think, one of the key features that is quite difficult to conceive of, of how this sort of um, integration occurs, um, despite the fact of these disparate brain regions. So let me give you an example of what's actually involved. Um, I'm coming here this evening, and I'm taking a bus from my house in central London to the Paddington station. I look at the, the bus coming towards me. It ought to be a red bus, not this one, but this was the only one I could find on the web. Um, and um, I check its number um, in order to see whether to get it on or not. What's involved in that? Well, there's the visual cortex, the auditory cortex, the infratemporal cortex, all these different regions are involved. I step towards the bus and then suddenly I realize that it's not the bus I want. I have to step back again. There's a signal in the amygdala which signals danger. And finally, there are the cerebellum and the motor cortex which coordinate my activities. And all of that has to be coordinated together within a very few seconds um, without, if you like, a central command, but simply the organization and the interaction of these different brain processes. Furthermore, the brain is not static. It's highly dynamic. Most regions of the brain are involved in almost all of the activities that we do. And I just want to show you one experiment in order to describe that this evening. And it's an experiment from my own laboratory. Um, <clears throat> most of the work I've done in the laboratory has been concerned with experimental animals and studying learning and memory in those. But I have ventured into the um, exciting terrain of brain imaging in humans. Because I work on memory, I wanted to study what happens in, when humans, we, are actually remembering something. Um, and I didn't want you to take it out of the standard psychiatric labo psychological laboratory where you give people lists of numbers um, or m nonsense syllables or artificial situations to study. So I was concerned with trying to think of, well, what I'd like to study per people's autobiographical memory. And that's very difficult because, of course, we all have different autobiographical memories. Could I think of something that we all or most of us do um, which actually is embedded in our memory? And um, I came up with supermarket shopping, which most of us do at least once a week. Um, so what we did was to take a group of volunteers, myself included, on a virtual supermarket tour through Sainsbury's. Um, could have been Waitrose, I suppose. But anyhow, every so often in this virtual supermarket tour, in which people sat in a machine called a magnetoencephalogram, which was actually measuring the minute electrical impulses through across different regions of the brain, measuring it in terms of the magnetic flux um, across the top of the brain, the, the video would stop and people would be asked to make a choice. 
a choice between, in this case, for example, different sorts of soft drink, different sorts of, um, of junk food, different sorts of um, wines, and so on and so forth. In the entire experiment, the supermarket tour stopped at about 80 different places, so there were about 80 different choices for people to make. Um, and it took about all of us about two seconds to make the choice of which of these three options we would like to buy if we wanted to buy any of them at all. And you simply signaled at the end of the experiment by pressing a button that you'd made the choice. It didn't matter what you chose. Um, what mattered to me in this experiment was what's going on in the brain, in the dynamics, while that choice is being made. And the magnetoencephalography enables you to make that study. Okay. Um, this is not the familiar brain images you're likely to see. You're now looking down from the top at the head of a person's head, nose, left and right part of the brain, and you're looking at the first second while that choice is being made, and the bright spots of the regions of the brain which are active in that particular period. So about 50 milliseconds, 50 thousandths of a second, um, after the images appear on the screen, the visual cortex in the brain lights up here, about 300 milliseconds later, the infrotemporal cortex here lights up. That's a region of the brain we know is associated with memory. It's about here. Um, and a little while later, you see the um, trace diffusing. This is Broca's area here, which is associated with speech. We are, if you like, articulating silently, or in some cases you could see people in the machine um, saying, it's, saying the names of the products directly to themselves. Finally, if and only if you prefer Coke to Pepsi or Pepsi to Coke, this region of the brain here, the left parietal, about 800 milliseconds downstream lights up, that's a region of the brain around here. Um, and you can see these, this is my brain as it happens, um, and I've, we've superimposed those um, different regions, uh, different lighting up areas on a more direct um, um, classical magnetic resonance imaging of my brain itself. So here's the visual cortex, and you can see the infratemporal cortex, the um, vocalization, Broca's area, and finally the parietal area there lighting up. Now I'm showing you that um, partly because I think it's magic that you can actually see what's going on in the brain in this dynamic sort of way, but much more importantly to try to emphasize the incredible dynamism of um, all of these brain regions simply in making a choice um, between are you going to buy this product or are you not going to buy this product. I should say that when we published these results, um, I was inundated with invitations from advertising agencies and firms, marketing companies, saying would I come and tell them how to advertise their products better. Um, but <laughs> that's called neuromarketing. Um, and, no, seriously. And I discovered afterwards that this experiment has appeared apocryphally in the literature. Um, the joke about preferring Coke to Pepsi has now actually been cited as a genuine experiment that was done. Such an urban myth created, but it is the case that BMW has set up a lab particularly to study brain imaging in the context of, um, of developing better brand loyalty for its cars. Now, what I want to come to at this stage is, the, is if you like, the more theoretical implications of, of all of those. Um, the question that I wanted to ask is um, what's been called technically in the scientific literature the binding problem, and that is there's no homunculus, so how does the coherence that we experience in making a decision of that sort emerge from self-organization, from all the interactions of the different regions of the brain? And I don't know the answer to the question because no neuroscientist actually does at the moment, but it is the sort of question with which many of our most interesting neuroscientific theoreticians are concerned with at the moment. Um, and it's something to do not just with the spatial organization, but the temporal organization, the way that these different regions of the brain cross-talk with one another um, during those milliseconds that I showed you in, in, in that previous study. What I want to ask, however, is a slightly more general theoretical question at this stage, and it takes me from, if you like, the hard stuff of the brain to the issues of the relationship between brain and mind. Um, if those regions of the brain light up in this sort of way, if we have got the possibility of um, reading them, of showing which brain cells are lighting up at which particular region, how they're connected, let's have a thought experiment. 
Um, so I've invented here a cerebroscope. Um, the term isn't mine. It's been around for some time. What my cerebroscope will do is it's a super-duper brain imaging system, and it's going to record the activities of all of the nerve cells in my brain, millisecond by millisecond. An observer is sitting, reading, looking at the readout from this machine, and what I want to ask is the theoretical question, um, would it show... Um, in that supermarket shopping experiment that I'm choosing Oasis rather than Evian or Pinot Grigio rather than Suave or whatever else um, the choices actually might be. Now, clearly, different regions of the brain are lighting up. The cerebroscope will be able to tell for sure um, that I'm looking at something, the visual cortex is lighting up. It'll be able to tell for sure that my memory is working. It may be able to see that I'm, I'm articulating something. Would it actually be able to read my mind from my brain in that sort of way, even if there is a unique one-for-one -one relationship between those um, brain lighting up, the brain cells lighting up and the actual thought and the choice that I'm making? Um, and the answer's no. And the answer's no because how my brain is wired up is not just general. I mean, all of us have got visual cortices. All of us, all normal brains are wired up in that sort of way. But the specificities of how my brain is wired up depend on my personal history. They depend on my entire um, experience during all the wiring up of all those nerve cells in all those complexities of synaptic connections through from the moment of conception, through my um, developmental phase inside the womb, through um, the early years of my childhood and so on. When all that brain development is happening, the synaptic connections are being made, the brain is self-organizing and wiring itself. Um, so my actual thoughts at any given moment are surely locatable in particular brain regions, but they will not be interpretable to any machine which does not know my entire history of how that wiring has occurred. Well, the next question then is whether it would actually be able to read it, supposing I don't just have a cerebroscope which can measure my brain activity now, but it had been wired up from my brain from the very beginning. Um, would it then be able to read uh, my thoughts. So it had mapped all the plotting of all these connections over all this period of time. Um, now, clearly, that's an impossible experiment to do, um, but it's, as a thought experiment, it's important to us because it does actually begin to tap in to trying to understand the relationship between mind and brain. Now, many of my neuroscientist colleagues would accept that it could, my cerebroscope would not work um, just if it measured me now. But most of them, I suggest, would argue that it would work if they could actually wire me up from the very beginning. I want to suggest that it still would not work. It still would not work for very important reasons. The important reasons are to do with the fact that the brain isn't, if you like, isolated inside your head. It's intimately connected with your body, and your body is intimately embedded in the social and cultural world in which we live. And because it is so embedded in that social and cultural world, it actually, means, it actually means that in order to interpret our brain images, we have to understand the meaning of the history, society, and culture which surround us. It becomes extremely important then for neuroscientists who say you are your brain, or you are your brain including free will, to recognize that you are not just your brain, you are a person, you are a person using your brain and a person who is embedded in a particular history, technology, society and culture. And I'll come back to that at the very end of what I want to say because I think it's quite fundamental in our understanding both the scale and the possibilities of the neurosciences. We have a very long way to go. Um, and the promises and the claims to explain the mind, consciousness, and so on, which you will read in many of the popular accounts of neuroscientists at the moment, are a little bit hubristic, I would say. Um, after 50 years of trying to study memory in the laboratory, um, I realize I know almost as little now as I knew when I started. I know an awful lot more biochemistry and physiology and so on, but how that relates to the, what goes on in my brain when I remember my fourth birthday party or even what I had for breakfast this morning is still, I think, something of an enigma. 
So, with that both excited, but nonetheless, I think, fairly cautious view of what neuroscience can tell us, um, I want to turn in the second section of what I want to say to the um, technologies which, despite the science or with the use of the science, the that are now being generated by the developments in the neuroscience labs at the moment. So let me look at the, to begin with, at the promises that are being made. Um, and I hinted at those at the very beginning of what I had to say. What's on offer are new treatments for damage and disease, controlling behavior, and even reading minds. And I want to look at some of those possibilities now um, and the things which make me encouraged and the things which make me a little concerned about. One of the most exciting developments is undoubtedly the linkage now of human and computers to make computer, human-computer in interfaces. It's been promised for a long time. Um, many of you have seen the sorts of um, showmanship that you can do, for example, um, by implanting a chip in your, in, which will enable you to um, open the door to your laboratory by thinking about it rather than actually pushing at a door. But it's got more subtle than that. It will be possible, it is possible, to begin to restore um, sight in certain cases of blindness by, um, put by, by vi implanted visual prostheses, sort of thing that Richard Gregory was speculating about many years ago. Um, it will be possible to, um, to use um, these technologies and computer technologies to enable people with um, paralysis to actually sort of move objects away, around and so on. And um, as a variety of that technique as well, there's a technique called transcranial brain stimulation, which puts a magnetic flux across different regions of the brain and can actually control and change um, it said um, problems of people with obsessive thought disorders and certain sorts of depression as well. Very experimental treatments, but they're absolutely there at the moment. I also think, quite apart from the implanted prostheses, one of the things that is likely to be on the cards in the course of the next few years is um, de developing techniques to actually sort of restore function from people with spinal lesions, people who are quadriplegic or paraplegic. It must be the case, I think, that the obstacles to actually achieving that sort of repair of spinal cord um, are, are potentially soluble by the use of stem cells. There are many problems with the use of stem cells, but and it's perfectly true that we've seen, seem to have been on the verge of being able to do that and to understand the technical problems of doing so for at least 20 years now. But I am reasonably convinced that in the next decades that must be one of the, 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 the potentially few good things so far as brain and, and, and central nervous system um, physiology that will come out of the development of the use of stem cells because in, in many other cases I'm pretty skeptical about them. So that's, if you like, a piece of optimism. If you actually turn to psychic distress, I become a little more concerned. There is a worldwide epidemic of depression. We know that. The World Health Organization has said it is the epidemic of the 21st century. Um, Antidepressant drugs are currently not very effective. The new generation or the newest generations of antidepressant drugs, the SSRIs and so on, are when you actually do the meta-analyses no more effective than the drugs that existed 20 or 30 years ago. They just have become a good deal more fashionable. Um, and it may be, it may be that we are simply asking the wrong questions. Is it the right way to go to look at the development of more pharmacogenetically tailored drugs, or should we begin to look at the epidemiology? Why is it that there is a worldwide epidemic of depression? Has something changed in our biochemistry and our neuroscience? Um, is there something wrong with the world around us? Should we not draw some conclusions from the fact that women are twice as likely to be diagnosed as depressed as men? And does that say something about the social relations of men and women um, in our society, rather than something about the differences between their pharmacology or their brains. Maybe the molecular emphasis that is placed by modern medicine on going deeper and deeper into the brain by the result of neuroscience is putting the question and asking the questions the wrong way around. 
Um, I throw this out as a suggestion to you, not because I wish to diminish the efforts made by my neuropharmacological colleagues in this area, but simply because I want to emphasize that unless we integrate our neuroscientific insights and understandings into a larger concept of neuroscience knowing its place in the world around us, we will not be able to achieve those broader visions of how to understand what it is to be a human being in the 21st century. Okay, let's take another one. Treating neurological disease, which is something that I now work on in the lab more than anything else. There are going to be better targeted drugs to treat Alzheimer's over the course of the next day, decades. And it is perfectly clear that in an aging population, um, Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia are a growing problem. There are 800,000 people suffering from Alzheimer's and current forms of dementia in Britain at the moment. Most of the drugs are only marginally effective. Um, a small proportion of, the, uh, of people suffering from Alzheimer's have a clear-cut genetic predisposition, um, something like 4 or 5 percent. For most cases, the cause is unknown, um, except uh, the best predictor of getting Alzheimer's disease is being old, and the next best predictor of, being Alzheimer's disease, of getting Alzheimer's disease is being, is being a woman, not a man. We don't understand why, um, and yet we do need some ways of actually treating it. So there are four currently licensed drugs which are claimed to enhance retention, in, uh, of, of memory retention as Alzheimer's, and memory cognitive decline, memory loss, is the initial diagnostic feature of the disease. Um, the little rotating one here, I couldn't resist putting in because that's the molecule that we're working on that um, our lab has developed at the moment, which certainly works on improving memory in experimental animals. Um, it hasn't yet, of course, been tried in humans. But for sure, either out of our lab or many of the other labs working in this area over the course of the next day, course, decade or so, there are going to be better drugs. Um, there are going to be ones which will enable people suffering from Alzheimer's to stay in the community longer. Um, and to remember where you left your car keys in the morning rather and to, and, and therefore to be able to survive as an independent person for longer than now. But they aren't going to prevent the decline in, uh, the inevitable progressive decline in disease. And what's nearly, really required now is the protective drugs to slow or prevent degenerate neurodegeneration, analogous to the way that many of us take statins um, to regulate our cholesterol levels to ward off the possibility of, 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 of heart attacks. Um, and the sort of brain shrinkage that you see in Alzheimer's disease is simply shown in the, in the right-hand pictures that there are there. Um, but there are no such drugs even thought about on the market at the moment. So that's a long way to go. And one should not think that the idea of producing cognitive enhancers, smart drugs, is necessarily an unalloyed benefit. They will be a potential palliative for Alzheimer's. They'll enhance the quality of life, but they won't restore old memories. Um, indeed, you could very well argue that in fact it's, unki it's unkind to some, someone in the deepest depths of Alzheimer's disease to restore memory and cognition so that people become conscious either the death of the of, of, of loved people around them or indeed of their own imminent and inevitable decline, our own inevitable and inevitable decline. Secondly, the idea that these drugs will then become um, much more generally available um, extension to everyone over 50, for example, because the American Diagnostic and Statistical Manual now says there's a, a syndrome that all of us over 50 suffer called age-associated memory impairment. The recreational use of the drugs, could they be regarded as steroids for the brain um, in the same way as um, they are, steroids are used for, for, for in, in athletics. Should they be banned? What are the ethical, legal, and social implications of the development of drugs of this sort um, widely available on the market? Can they indeed be regulated at all when you can buy anything you want off the internet in this particular sort of way? So the moment you begin to think about the development of drugs of this sort, you also begin to think about the fact that there are a great range of potential problems associated with them. None of these things are unalloyed benefits. 
which is why the issue of the ethical and social and legal implications of developments in the neurosciences become increasingly important for us at the moment. Then, one of the other things that's happening, um, and it's of even more concern to me at any rate, is what are the disputed borderlines between being undesirable and being ill. And I've listed here a number of the categories, the diagnostic categories that appear in the American Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Psychiatry. Um, and you will see perhaps where I'm going in this. Not only age-associated memory impairment, but attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, which I'll talk about a bit more in a moment. But then these other ones, compliance disorder, oppositional defiance disorder, disruptive behavior disorder, conduct disorder, all of which I suspect I could have been prosecuted for or psychiatrically diagnosed with over the course of my career. And if I hadn't been, I would be rather sorry that I had failed. Because <laughs> So we are moving here into an area of what I would call medicalization of, um, of, in, 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 of um, the ways in which people behave um, and in a way which seems to me to present, have implications which are distinctly worrying. And what I want to emphasize in this context or exemplify in this context is a strange case of a condition which many of you will be familiar with called attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. A disorder, as I um, will say, did not exist in Britain as a diagnosis um, 20 years ago, but is now a very wide one. Children with ADHD are being diagnosed on the basis of um, their not getting on with their parents, they're being disruptive or overactive in class, and not getting on with their teachers. Now, I've taken this quotation from a very distinguished um, British professor of um, education, um, and he describes the condition of ADHD. And I just want us to reflect briefly on what it's actually saying. Children with ADHD disturb their parents and teachers because their classroom achievements are erratic. They're a source of exasperation to the teacher. The child may show high levels of performance, a ready wit, um, erratic performance. This is the pupil who never seems to be in his or her seat, constantly bothering classmates, relied upon for little other than being generally off task. All categories can be frustrating to teach because of their apparent unpredictability, their failure to conform to expectations, etc. Um, now that's a very interesting quotation. So is the child being diagnosed because he, and it's mainly a boy, is a nuisance to the teacher? Um, is it, is, so is the diagnosis a way of helping the teacher or is it a way of helping the child? If we're giving this child drugs in order to control its behavior, is the child getting the drug in order to, in order to make his parents' lives more easy, his teacher's life more easy, or are we really trying to be a benefit to that child itself? These are the increases in prescriptions that we've seen in the diagnoses of ADHD over the course of the last years. Um, there are now over 4.4 million children in, uh, in the States um, who are being diagnosed with ADHD, 8% of all U.S. children. British pediatricians who would have said when I asked them 20 years ago about this disease when I first heard about it in the States, said one in 500 UK children maybe would be diagnosed as hyperkinetic. Now say the figures in Britain are between 4 and 5% of all school children. The increase in UK Ritalin prescriptions you see there, 2,000 a year in 1991, 2007 um, there were 600,000 prescriptions issued a year. A huge increase in the, in the prescription of a drug called methylphenidate. Um, methylphenidate is an amphetamine-like drug. I was interested to read the paper which brought David Nutt into such trouble with Alan Johnson, in which he lists drugs in order of their harmful effects. Methylphenidate, in his listing, ranks above ecstasy at the moment. And yet we are penalizing our children or criminalizing the use of ecstasy and thrusting methylphenidate down the throats of children whether they want it or not. Now, there's something seriously wrong with what is going on in this particular sort of way. And as we're moving in towards this psycho-civilized society, I think we need to think very clearly about the implications of directions in which we are going, courtesy of the wondrous achievements of neuropharmacology. 
So the threats beyond the borderline of a psycho-civilized society become, I think, quite serious. The drugs to control behavior I've spoken about already, um, neuromarketing I've spoken around already, genetic predestination, the idea that you can pre-diagnose people um, for potential conditions, is a potential benefit and a potential hazard, as we will see and electromagnetic thought control, which I will come on to in a moment, um, in the context of the new military technologies, which is where I will end this rather gloomy catalogue of problems that I want to present you with. Now, brain imaging is a brilliant research tool. There's no question about it. Any neuroscientist is incredibly excited by what we can actually see and the sorts of experiments that are now possible to it. But there are dangers of prospective diagnoses, um, for example, of psychopathy, antisocial behavior, um, and of what I would call internal surveillance. The claim, for example, that you can pre-diagnose people with no particular behavioral signs or symptoms of being likely to be psychopathic seems to me to be a particularly serious issue. It raises huge problems of what you might call, as it were, thought crime, what you might also want to deduce, I think quite wrongly, from looking at, the property, looking at what's going on in what um, some of the more cynical um, of my neuroscience colleagues now call the voodoo correlations that you can see between different bits of the brain lighting up and different bits of behavior. But I have seen a video clip of a British Home Office forensic psychiatrist standing in front of, on television of two images, one in which he says, this is, the, this is the brain of a murderer, and the other saying, this is the brain of a normal person, and saying, you see, we can diagnose and pre-diagnose the possibility of psychopathy in this sort of way. Um, now... I'm not sure if anyone attempted brain scans of either Mr. Blair or Mr. Bush before the... Um, but I doubt that they would have shown these signs. And yet I think we have to look very carefully at the, uh, at the issues that are involved in what I would call this internal surveillance. And you see it even more clearly in this, um, which is yet another brain imaging technique, which I've taken off of the website of an American company, now promising a technique called brain fingerprinting. Um, how do we determine, the website asks, if a person is a terrorist or a spy? There's a new technology that for the first time allows us to measure scientifically if specific information is stored in a person's brain. The technique can determine the presence or absence, such as terrorist training and associations. It can help discover if a person has committed terrorist act, has been trained as a terrorist, is a terrorist leader. Now, to be frank, this is snake oil. But it's snake oil, which is quite sinister, because we're beginning to see this, these techniques pressed into use by governments desperate to increase the degree of surveillance over their communities, over their populations, and um, being dragged into use in the courts as well in order, as a more sophisticated form of lie detection to detect whether a person is or has or has not committed particular crimes. Um, and I find this an extremely disturbing prospect, but one which, again, the marvelous techniques we've got are opening up for us at the moment. Finally, the military and neuroscience. Many of these techniques are of interest to the military, and what one has seen over the course of the last 10 or 20 years is increasing interest by the military, firstly in the development of new psychoactive chemical weapons for field and population use, um, things called karmatives, um, Karmatives first hit the literature in, or the public gaze about seven years ago um, when Russian special forces sprayed a, a substance called fentanyl into a theater in Moscow in which um, um, people were being held hostage by Chechen fighters. And the fentanyl killed something like 129 of the, of the hostages. Um, but nonetheless, um, these potential techniques of what are called non-lethal psychoactive agents are now heavily under investigation. Um, the cognitive enhancers and modafinil, which increases attention, are being used routinely by the U.S. military, particularly in terms of keeping pilots awake over long bombing missions over Iraq and I guess now Afghanistan and so on. 
And there are a huge number of research contracts now being let. let. We know about them in the States because America is much more open about what's going on than other countries. I'm not suggesting this is a uniquely American prospect. Um, for example, to use the techniques of microwave transcranial magnetic stimulation to manipulate and control behavior at a distance. So these are the sorts of prospects which the new brain sciences are also opening up for us at the moment. Now, back, what concerns me is this. Back, for those of you who are familiar with Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, he invented a universal drug in the 1930s, which was called Soma, which when the people got miserable, um, they could pop. And the routine was, hug me till you drug me, honey, love's as good as Soma. Now, we're not moving into a world in which there is one universal drug that will do this, but we are moving into a world in which there are a vast ways of, range of ways in which we, um, or, or, or medicine, or the state, can change our minds. And I'm rather worried about this. Um, back in the 60s, there was a slogan on an Oxford College wall saying, do not adjust your minds, the fault is in reality. And I am really quite worried about the extent to which we will move um, from adjusting the world around us to adjusting at the internal, um, uh, our internal states. But despite all, I want to end on an open optimism. I want to remind us of the cerebroscope and to point out that the brain is embodied and the body is embedded. We are embedded, we as people are embedded, our brains are embedded in our bodies, and the body is in the world. It's embedded in a matrix of the social, the cultural, the technological, um, which means that neuroscience, in order to try to understand what's going on, has to, has to address issues which are raised by not other sciences as well, sciences of sociology, of anthropology, culture, history, economics, and technology. So very finally, to return to the minds and the brains, minds, I want to argue, are like, like brains, they construct themselves during development. They're open systems. They're enabled by our brains. We are not our brains. We use our brains um, to think and to do things, just in the same way as I use our legs for walking. But we, it's not our legs that walk, it's we that walk with our legs. It's not our brains that think, it's we that think with our brains. And minds deal in meaning, not information. And the meaning is created, um, I want to argue, by living people in interaction with our own history and culture. And that comes to the final issue of where in the neuros is the neuroscientist telling us anything about those old issues of freedom and choice. And so what I want to finish up with, and um, it's not tended to, intended to be a sermon, is to argue that choice and freedom occur at the interface of many determinants. And these are our nature as, evolution, as evolutionally developed, evolved organisms, our own development as biological organisms in history and in society. And our freedom lies at the intersection of these many determinants. So the lessons from neuroscience as from philosophy, are that we are free to make our own futures, though in circumstances not of our own choosing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen, very much. I'm pleased to say that Stephen has agreed to answer questions, so we can take a few questions. I need to just say to you that the lecture is videoed. However, you won't have the camera panned onto you if you choose to ask, ask a question. Uh, it, of course, will still <laughs> pan out to you, Stephen. So please, if there are people who would like to ask Stephen questions, uh, indicate, um, please, can they be questions rather than statements? And we have a roving microphone, so if you put your hand in the air and the microphone could get you, please. There's one down the front here, and. Um, just to ask with the questions of the mind related to the brain, do you feel we're getting closer to an answer for the question of consciousness and where it lies within ourselves and with the whole dualist argument 
that's been raging for years now. I, I didn't know, Malcolm, if you wanted a bunch of questions. Um, consciousness will take us at least the remaining time that there is. I, you, like me, and probably many others here, are familiar with a very large number of books written claiming to be able to explain consciousness as a brain process at the moment, or even reduce consciousness, which some neurophilosophers have called folk psychology, into, sort of com in, in, into computer generated sort of, um, cognitive neuroscience. I have a great problem in the way that they actually work because the way they work is a classical reductionist strategy and I'm referring as, as an exemplar to the way in Christoph Koch and, and Francis Crick have actually phrased it. We don't understand consciousness, they say, but let's say consciousness is a sort of awareness. It's the opposite of being asleep. You're being awake, you're conscious. If consciousness is awareness, well, maybe we can study a particular feature of awareness, um, such as um, vision, and then we'll study visual perception, and because we'll study visual perception, we will suddenly be able to understand the whole processes involved in consciousness. Now, I think that is an incredibly narrow reductionist approach to the complexities of being, of, 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 um, of, 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 of what we mean by the term consciousness. It omits, for example, the multiple meanings of the term, Freudian consciousness, uh, the subconscious in Freudian sense, or the ways in which we speak in, um, outside the laboratory in terms of people's class consciousness, race consciousness, social consciousness, um, feminist consciousness, or the way consciousness is transformed by people's, people's awareness of the world around them being switched um, in the way that we've seen so many times over the course of the last um, few decades. Um, to reduce all of that to the workings of... Um, <laughs> as Francis Crick speculated in his book, The Astonishing Hypothesis, that free will is located in the anterior cingulate gyrus, seems to me to be the sort of arrogance that we could do without. Um, I really do think that in order to explore the issues of consciousness, we need to know that our brains are necessary for consciousness, but we need also to understand and be a little humble in favor of the insights into consciousness and thought and mentality which have been given by other disciplines. I've not even mentioned the novelists. Read David Lodge's very interesting um, novel called Thinks, which contrasts the way that a cognitive neuroscientist um, talks about consciousness and a literary scholar thinks, t talks about it. And you will see there's a whole rich world of understanding of consciousness, which if we don't come to terms with as neuroscientists, I think we just lock ourselves in our laboratories, and I think that would be a pity. Roderick McKinley, Bristol University. Um, two questions, if I may. Um, going back to the problem of um, uh, complex self-organization in the brain, to what extent will, do you think that progress um, towards answering that question will come from um, answering the uh, questions concerning self-organization in a variety of systems, um, economic systems, living systems, and so forth? And the other question, given that people appear to be ever more marginalized from a scientific discourse, um, what hope can we hold out for these um, um, applications of uh, neuroscience which are more um, oppressive and controlling to not come about? Um, I'd like to, to, to answer the second one first, if I may. But I'm not sure if people are more and more separated from scientific discourse. I mean, if, if, I mean the existence of discussions of this sort, the, the huge amount of material there is on the web, on, the, in, in, on television, and so on. What we need to do is achieve techniques for actually engaging citizenry directly upstream, as it's called, um, in, in scientific developments. I was involved um, to a couple of years ago in a very interesting project hosted by a couple of European foundations called the Meeting of Minds, which recruited groups of citizens from, all, from a whole range, nine different um, EU countries, to discuss with um, neuroscientific experts the developments that were going on in the neurosciences and trying to formulate recommendations which then went up to the European Parliament as to the development, for example, of a European-wide council for neuroethics, um, how, how you could regulate fine, uh, research and so on. Now, these are very tentative attempts and we don't know how to do it very well, but those are the directions I think we, are, we, we must explore. 
Um, and I can be critical of them because they don't work very well, but I know we have to try and find those techniques. Now about self-organization, which I think, this, I think that the, the modeling of self-organization in complex systems, computer modeling and so on, um, I'm thinking particularly of the sorts of things that Stu Kaufman and the Santa Fe Institute does. I guess you were as well. Um, I think can be very, very helpful indeed. Um, one of the problems, I think, of the modeling is um, that self-organization is still, um, if you like, a matter of spatial relationships. One of the things I tried to show in that um, picture of the dynamic brain is the necessity to combine space and time in our interactions. Um, there are a lot of suggestions, for example, that brain activities are coordinated by a way of a, 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 40, a 40 hertz theta rhythm, um, for, for example. Um, and so you can have regions which are lo time locked together in coherent oscillations um, because of their temporal relationships rather than their spatial relationships. And we just need different ways of thinking about it. We're very committed to thinking in a reified um, um, product rather than process sort of way in Britain. If I may give an example, um, I'm not quite sure when Malcolm and I last saw one another. It's quite some little time back, but we recognize one another the moment we met. And you should say, well, what's actually surprising about that? Of course you recognize him. But every single molecule and every single cell in his body and my body has turned over and been transformed many billions and billions of times since we last met. And yet he's still he and I'm still me. And that's a unity which is given by process rather than a unity which is given by things. And we're not very good in the Western tradition um, of thinking about process rather than product, which is why people reify consciousness in that sort of way. And we need, I think, to enrich the way we think about things. Sorry, that's a rather telegraphed answer to two very complicated questions. We've just been reminded by the great bell that time is passing, so we'll just take one more question. If we've got one more question, Does someone like to the back. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'd just like to ask, um, you were talking about human beings and being embedded within, obviously they're embodied and also embedded within a culture. Um, I wondered if there was any, uh, anything uh, in the research that was coming across how we process symbolism, um, how, we, how we turn... Um, perceptions of, you know, I'm recognizing your face, I've seen it on the cover of a book, this kind of thing, like there's a body of information attached to that. How we, how we construct these things within the mind. Um, how, we how we construct... How, how the brain goes about constructing these uh, symbolic... Well, um, clearly um, one of the features which distinguishes humans from our nearest evolutionary... Um, um, of relatives, um, take bonobos and chimpanzees, is that um, we can use symbols in a way that they cannot. Um, if I'd um, gone another way in this talk, I would have talked about Kanzi, the chimpanzee, the bonobo chimpanzee, who can actually manipulate symbols um, on, a, on a pin board um, because he can't speak, of course. Um, but the very existence of the, the transition between the possibility of speaking and the possibility of not uh, compared with our um, evolutionary ancestors, I think, has transformed the possibility of using symbolic language. In that sense, I agree with the evolutionary perspectives of people like Mark Hauser and, um, and, and Noam Chomsky. But the ways in which we manipulate and have the capacity to manipulate symbols, I think, have come from an evolutionary development um, which has enabled humans to speak in, the way that, in, in a way that our nearest evolutionary neighbors can't. Once you've said that, um, and clearly saying, okay, we have a brain which is predisposed to actually extract meaning from the world around us, um, meaning from the variety of sensory input that comes into us from, from, um, from, ch from early childhood onwards, we clearly have a brain which is predisposed to construct order out of that and to therefore construct symbolic representations from that. Just how those symbolic representations are constructed um, and how they differ from culture to culture is, um, I think, something which we are way, way away from understanding at the neuroscientific level. But it is clearly a fundamental question that needs to be asked, and the organization and development of the brain have something to do with it, but so has indeed the culture in which that brain is embedded. Stephen, thank you very much. I'm sure we will all want to 
thank Professor Rose very much for what has been a most stimulating and I think appropriately called thought-provoking lecture. Thank you very much, Steve. I'd, I'd, I'd like to thank you all for coming, including my many neuroscientists and, and re related colleagues whom I see in the audience. I'd like to thank also and pay tribute to the University of Bristol for setting up what I think has been a marvellous series of centenary lectures. I only wish I'd been in some of the other ones rather than my own. <laughs>